We welcome all of you that have come tonight and also those who have joined us on live stream. This is the fellowship of the concerned and the fellowship of those who are anticipating the coming of the Lord. <clears throat> Some professing Christians are really not anticipating the coming of the Lord. Of course, for anyone who is not anticipating it, it will not go well for them for them at that time. They're what the scriptures refer to as not being ready. Be ye also ready. That's that's the commission. That's a great. That's a great, another one of those great commissions. This will be our twelfth message on this subject. Tonight, the coming of the Lord and the table of the Lord. <clears throat> You've heard our text. And we do this in remembrance of Jesus at his request till he come. Some people have speculated whether we will observe the Lord's table on the other side. I don't know. I'm sure there will be some, some kind of recollection, but my own persuasion is it will be of a higher order yeah. than here. It will not be one by faith. It will not be one of expectation. It'll, it's just like, yeah. We're not going to forget that yeah. what is memorialized in the table, but I'm thinking about the table here. As uh, we've uh, demonstrated during these sermons, the coming of the Lord is related to a number of things. It does, it's not a truth that it stands off by itself. It's related, for instance, to the resurrection of the dead. When Jesus comes again, the dead are going to be raised. It's, it's connected with the end of the world. When Jesus comes again, the heavens are going to pass away with the great noise and the elements melt with fervent heat. It's a... Connected with the day of judgment, for he's coming to judge the earth with righteousness. So it's connected with keeping the commandments. Keep this commandment till the Lord come. Amen. It's connected with giving an account unto God, for when he comes, we'll all give an account of ourselves to God. It's also connected with the vindication of God. God has been uh, represented as being wrong, or at least doubtful. God has been right. Amen. Everything he has said is right. Amen. And everyone who conflicts is in conflict with what God said or did is wrong. Yes. And God has appointed a day following the coming of the Lord as the Lord's coming is going to kick everything off. Yeah. First thing we're going to do is going to wipe the slate clean. Nature is going to get gone Amen. as it is now. And then God's going to prove and convince everybody that he was right in everything he said and everything he did. The coming of the Lord's connected with that. And, and the coming of the Lord's connected with the uh, table of the Lord, as we're going to deal with tonight. Now, it should be apparent that the coming of the Lord is a serious event and something that should be set before God's people. Now, this is not customary in our time. Anyone who says it is, they're just wrong. There are people who do, I understand this, but as a rule, professing Christians are not regularly reminded of the coming of the Lord. Very few people know very much at all about it. Only what they maybe they read in a book or heard on the TV or something. They very little is known about this subject among professing Christians. You, if you don't believe it, just ask some of them. Yeah. Just pick out some and ask. What do you know about the second coming of Christ? And you'll find out that this is not generally there's not general knowledge about this subject, which. Whatever may be said now in favor of the 
modern church, nominal church, by name only. We are exempting the remnant and the faithful people with their excluded from this. Whatever may be said about it, that condition negates any profession of faith. It negates. Because if you're not, if people are not ready for the coming of the Lord, they have a fearful expect, a fearful expectation, looking for a firing judgment and indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. That's what, as we wait. So, this is the last of three epochal appearings of Christ. The first one, speaking chronologically, was when he appeared once in the end of the world to put away sin. That is the only time sin will be dealt with by Christ yes, amen. in a provisionary sense. Once in the end of the world, he appeared. That is, he was safe. Everybody saw him. Whether they believed him or not, that's another matter, but everybody saw him. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't an idea. He really did make, he appeared and every eye saw him. Wherever he went, people saw him. Amen. He is now appearing in the presence of God for us all. That's, a, that's appearing that's going on now. And without that appearing, the first appearing is no. Yeah. Yeah. If Jesus is not now appearing before the presence of God, then the effectiveness of the first appearing is not taking place. As two appearings. And the third appearance, one, he will appear to them that look for him. That doesn't mean only those that look for him will see him. But to those that look for him, he'll appear without sin. That's, yeah. that's what that means. So those that look for him, he's not going to come and hold out their sin in front of them. And he's not going to come to deal with sin either. He already dealt with sin. Right. So this is the third of these epochal appearances. Now we're going to draw an association of this coming of the Lord with the table of the Lord. Now the table of the Lord is a place where we focus on the death of Christ. <clears throat> and the death of Christ, I want to comment briefly on the significance of the death of Christ because it, it's the hub yes. on which everything else turns. Yeah. The death of Christ. The death of Christ, that's where Satan's head was bruised. Yes. <laughs> the day of salvation kicked off with a bruised Satan. Mm -hmm. The prior ages ended with a bruised Christ. Christ will recover from his bruise. He recovered from his bruise in his resurrection. See, Satan bruised his body, didn't bruise his spirit. Amen. God struck Jesus spirit not not Satan so Satan's head was bruised when Jesus died that's how critical Christ's death is you'll no more be convinced that Satan's been defeated than you are that Jesus has died there Christ's death well ransom was paid wasn't paid to Satan like some charismatic people teach it was paid to God the debt was owed to God. Satan didn't know. No debt is owed to Satan. That's right. At all. The debt is owed to God. And sin produced a debt, and Christ's death is the point at which the debt was paid. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, as Matthew 20, 28 says. The forgiveness of sins. He laid down his life. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, 28. So God doesn't speak sin away arbitrarily. It had to be taken away. Amen. And it happened at Christ's death. That's where it happened. The new covenant is ratified or put into force by the blood of Christ. Christ's death is a thing that undergirds the new covenant. Well, people have to see have to yes. see that the new covenant is not a set of rules. That's right. yeah. it's, it's actually a, a series of promises, mm -hmm. but it's based on Christ's death yeah, and on His blood, yes. the only innocent blood that there has ever been. Yeah, 
Jesus said, I'm showing the importance of Christ's death. See, the death. Jesus purchased the church in his death with his own blood. Acts 20, 28 says he purchased the church with his own blood. When he died, he bought. So I'm going to associate the second coming of Christ with the death of Christ and the Lord's table. So I'm showing here the Lord's table is not just a church ordinance. Yeah, that's right. It's God's way of ensuring that his son's death is not forgotten. Amen. Now, the closest thing to this kind of ordinance that was under the law was the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day ensured that people would remember God. One day a week, they remembered God. That was a day devoted to God. If he didn't institute that, they'd have forgot it. They would never have remembered him at all. But that's why it was instituted, so they would not forget God. This table's instituted so we will not forget Christ's death, which to the New Covenant era is like the creation was to the Old Covenant era. And at the cross and Christ's death justification, the clearing of guilt took place. We're justified by his blood, the scripture says. So, so you're the change of status from unaccepted to accepted yes. is because of Christ's blood, which took place at the cross, which is what we remember at this table. Sin was condemned. This is the centrality now and the significance of Christ's death. Yeah. See, enough, enough is not made of Christ's death yeah, amen. in our time. I don't know that it, is, it has ever been at a satisfactory level, the centrality of the death of Christ. Sin was condemned in the flesh of Christ. Yeah satisfactorily condemned in the death of Christ. Completely and thoroughly by God condemned in the flesh of Christ. Sin was judged in Jesus. And there's no, he bore his sins, our sins in his body on the tree, but it's, it's not in his body now. And if anyone's in Christ, there is no sin in him. Amen. You're not connected with sin in Christ. Jesus died, the scriptures declare, Romans 14, 9, that he might be Lord of the dead and the living. In other words, he had to yield himself to the last enemy. Death is the last enemy. There's no, for the people of God, there's no more enemies after death. That's the last. Yeah. Amen. It's the last enemy. So if you're able to be conscious when you die, mm -hmm. you can say goodbye to death. Goodbye, death. I'm done with you now. I just passed through this narrow passage, and I'm done with it. Finally, once and for all, because Jesus died so he could be the Lord of the dead, the ones that already passed on, and the living. That's how important Christ's death is. You say, well, I thought he was like over everything before. Well, yes, in his pre-incarnate state, he was... <laughs> Overall, there wasn't anything that wasn't under him before. That was before. Now, as a man, he's over. As a man, he's Lord over the dead and the living. See, that's that. In redemption, we had to have a member of, of, of humanity had to be over the dead and the living. At the last person, Satan would have, if that plan would have been presented before Satan, he would have been glad to hear it because he thought he would, man, he was invincible when dealing with man. But I come up against another man now. He's come up against another man who's passed through the last domain of death over which Satan had was the administrator of it. He's passed through it now, and now he's lord of the dead and the living. He can bring the dead back and he can keep the living. Amen. <laughs> I'm showing now the importance of Christ's death. Christ's death 
the understanding of it has constraining power. Yes. It, can, it can enable you and make you do what law can't make you do. There are some things you just can't get done because you ought to do it. You need, you need a, another degree of power. And the love of Christ constraineth us, the scripture yeah. says. For we thus judge, if one died for all, then we're all dead. In other words, he died for all. It's the idea. And the death of Christ, once it's planted in your soul, you see it. You see why Christ died. You saw what happened when Christ died, and you're convinced of it. It's not just a theory. It's not just a church dogma. You see it. There isn't anything you won't do for the Lord. Amen. The Lord says, run through a troop. You'll run through it. <laughs> he says, leap over the wall. You'll leap over it. Huh? He says, resist the devil. You resist him. Amen. Powerful death. In Christ's death, he delivered us from the present evil world. As Galatians 1, 4. Delivered us. From this present evil, the pull of it, the power of it, the dominance of it. He delivered us from the, this present evil world from which we were not delivered before. We were in bondage under the elements of the world. We're in bondage to the God of the world. We're in bondage to the rulers of the darkness of the world. See, we, we are in bondage to spiritual wickedness in high places that govern the world. And it's Christ's death that freed us. That was the last bastion of satanic power. Once you got past that, Satan didn't have any other dominion. He had no dominion after that. So he delivered us. He say, <laughs> Satan wouldn't have let you go if he didn't have to. He didn't volunteer to let you go. It's how important Christ's death is now. It's in his death, Satan was bruised and we were delivered. And in Christ's death, we were redeemed from the curse of the law. The curse of the law was not poverty and sickness, like the media ministers say. That's blasphemy. That's terrible. I once, uh, Sister June, where she went to church, the charismatic church, and I held a revival there, and so 11 of them, as a matter of fact. And I told him one night I was going to preach a sermon on a, a poor beggar that went to heaven and a rich man that went to hell. I knew they'd be interested in that. They tried to, they made him very nervous. The curse of the law is, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the law. That's the curse of the law. If you, don't, if you didn't do it, lock, stock, and barrel, as they say, you were cursed. As whether you were rich or whether you were poor, whether you were well or whether you are sick. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So the curse that was due us fell on Christ when he died. See, I'm pointing at the point of his death. That's the point in which this occurred. And in his death, he made peace. He made it. He created it between God and men who were at enmity with one another. God was against us, and we were against God. There was a wall between us and God. And in his death, he made peace through the blood of his cross. He's dead. That's how important a death is. And there are a number of references to the cross that's a, that's a synonym for Christ's death. Takes the cross, that's where he died. He didn't die like in a tomb after he laid idle for a while. He didn't die in Garden of Gethsemane, as one man once told us. He died on a cross. That's where he had the cross. And the cross is where all of the necessary things for salvation were wrought out which had to do with the destruction of Satan, the clearing away of the guilt of sin, the deliverance from the world, and boiling of principalities and powers, and the removal of the law, and all those things. That was done in Christ's death. That's where His death is where it was done. 
In other words, the cross of Christ is the pivot where sin was dealt with, the devil was destroyed, principalities and powers were plundered, and God was satisfied. He saw the travail of his soul, which was on the cross. He saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. That's enough. He says, though God said, I'll require no more. Not one ounce more will be required for the remission of sins and is accomplished at this death right here. If you can have faith in this, and believe God, you'll be free. Amen. Free from guilt, free from the world, free from the devil, and free from everything else that binds. Right. Now, <clears throat> that's what it was accomplished in his death. See, I'm showing the, the scope of Christ's death because I'm afraid enough's not said of Christ's death. Amen. Most people say, well, Christ died because he loved us and Christ took away our sins, and that's pretty much just what they do. No, Amen. but there's a lot happened. That would never have happened if Jesus didn't die. And Jesus' death was a miracle. Amen. Was a miracle. Because yeah. he had done no sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Neither was guile in his mouth. And death is the penalty for sin. And Jesus hadn't sinned. So how did he die? Well, he gave. It was a miracle. Mm -hmm. He yielded up himself to die. Mm -hmm. It was a miracle. Mm -hmm. I like to think of it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Now, spiritual life is, is lived in an awareness of Christ's death. See, I've showed you what the death of Christ, what it, why it's got to be this way, because this is where all of the preparatory work was done in the cross. So Paul says, well, I'm crucified with Christ. He, he didn't say, now I'm exalted with Christ. No. I'm crucified with Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nevertheless, I live. Well, Jesus lives too. Jesus was crucified, but he's alive forevermore. He didn't say, I was crucified with Christ. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what he said. He said, I am crucified with Christ. I'm identified with Christ's death, so whatever happened at Christ's death has now happened to me. Yes. Yeah. All those benefits that we, we talked about, I'm a partaker of all those benefits now because I am cruci am. I'm on the cross too. Jesus was taken down from the cross. I was put up on the cross. When Jesus came down, I was put up. So to speak, on the same cross. I was put on the cross where flesh was condemned. I was put on the cross where Satan was bruised. I was put on that cross. I was put on it. And my job, I'm staying there. Yeah, the part yeah. the part of me that's crucified, I'm yeah. keeping it crucified. Amen. And the scriptures come right out and tell us, they that are Christ's, that the, who belong to Christ, Galatians 5, 24, have crucified the flesh with the, together with its lusts. Not they ought to. <laughs> Not they ought to. They that are Christ's, those that have been joined to them, those that are his brethren, those that are God's sons, those that have been joined to the Lord, they crucify, they have crucified the flesh. They started out their newness of life with the, with the old man and the flesh being pinioned to the cross. And they have entered into it with its affections and lusts. Yeah, yeah. They have taken the affections of the flesh and they've put them on the cross. Amen. They that are, that's they that are Christ's. You say, well, what about those that haven't done that? They're not Christ's. Yeah. Now, I mean, they may be church members. They may be nice people. But if they've not crucified the flesh, they're not Christ's. Yeah. Because they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. Amen. Paul put it another in a in a uh, another way that intrigues me. He says we bear about in our body. It's a flesh and blood body. We bear about in our body the dying 
of the Lord Jesus <laughs> in our body. This, all your lusts are in your body. Everybody understands this. Don't you? That when you get out of the body, the lusts go too. If you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, they, they go with the person who's out of Christ and they'll never be able to be fulfilled. But I bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. It takes flesh a while to die. Just like it took Jesus a while to die when he's on the cross. With him, it was a matter of hours because he, so much was compacted into those hours. But for flesh to, to die, it's got to stay on the cross for, for a while. Some people aren't willing to leave it there very long. Oh, maybe for Lent or something like that, you know. But uh, that's... They that are Christ have crucified the flesh, and they, they are willing to bear in their body. People should be able to tell by looking at how you live whether you're crucified or not. Yes, amen. Well, in fact, they can if they got to have some understanding. I see, see, I peep, see people. It's, it breaks my heart. I don't. There's nothing as a person I can do about it except just to do my best to warn people and this sort of thing. But I see people that just let too much hang on to them. They live too close to the world. There's there's fleshly lust. They war against the soul. Peter says they war against the soul now. And they keep entertaining them and feeding them and they make friends with people that have them and they go places where they're dominant. And they, you see, they, they're not bearing about in their body the dying of the Lord Jesus. But if you're in Christ, you can do this. There's grace to do this. You first of all must be convinced, of course, that it's necessary. Newness of life postulates or presumes that you have participated in Christ's death. The text is found in Romans 6, 4, we're buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also might walk in newness of life. But walking in newness of life presumes you died. Yes. Amen. If you didn't die, no newness of life. You just took kind of a miniature bath, that's all. Nothing of significance really happened. And I'm persuaded that with a lot of professing Christians, nothing of significance has ever really happened to them. They've never really died. With Christ. You've got to die with Christ. As you have to be on the cross, he was on. You have to die with him before you can have newness of life. And Paul, he, he made this statement in Galatians 6.14, which is a very telling statement. He said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Jesus Christ, by whom, not by which, by whom I have been crucified. I glory in the cross Why? because of what's happened there, what's happening there. Now that I'm on the cross with Christ, crucified with him, there's things transpiring in me. Paul saying it didn't transpire before. I'm for a great awakening and a great revival of spiritual dying. Dying to the world. Dying to the course of the world. That all happens when you're when you glory in the cross. <laughs> now you're beginning to make some association I gather with this with this table here. We're glorying in the cross here. That's, that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're glorying in it because we see what happened there. Yeah. The dilemma that couldn't be solved otherwise has been solved. Moses couldn't solve it. The prophets yeah. couldn't solve it. John the Baptist couldn't solve it. But it was solved at the cross. Mm -hmm. We glory in it. Left it high. Raise up the cross like Moses raised up the serpent. Yeah. The cross is a drawing card. That's a drawing yeah. card. I, if I be lifted up, will draw men unto me. John says, now he said this uh, concerning the manner of death, which he would. <laughs> yeah, he didn't mean, I've heard people used to say that, left up Christ in your preaching. That's Well, you do left up Christ in his preaching, but you left up his death. Yes. 
I, if I be lifted up, as he was talking about this, what's what this, what the scripture says? He's speaking, speaking about the manner of death he died. That's right. The death of Christ is what draws the people. Amen. The people that are really seeking the Lord. The people that are laboring or heavy laden, mm -hmm. those people. The people that are tired of being dominated by sin, those people. It's the death of Christ that draws them. Amen. Glory in the cross. It's not possible to prepare for the coming of the Lord by ignoring or minimizing his death. Yes. Amen. This is taught in Romans 3.25. We're justified through faith in his blood. That's right. yeah. Every version reads the same way. Through faith in his blood. Now, some years ago, a teacher for whom I had general respect, but whom I did not believe was superior as a teacher, he said our faith is not in the blood. Well, you made a dogmatic statement. And I had to correct him in the presence of some people, and he's a lot older than me. No, it is faith in the blood. Amen. Amen. That's what it says, Romans 3.25, through faith in his blood. All right, now where is it that our minds are centered at this table? It's in his blood. That's right. It's in his death. That's the whole focus. Yes. Mm -hmm. We don't come at this table to remember his resurrection. Mm -hmm. Although we do remember his resurrection, but that's not the focus yeah. of this table. Right. Yeah. We, don't, we don't come to this table to remember his earthly ministry. Mm -hmm. Although we do with gladness recall how he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, but that's not what this table is for. Yeah. I say that's not what that's this right. table is for. This table is to remember Christ's death. Paul gave his special instructions. He is the only scriptural writer who commented on the Lord's table. How's that? And he did it because Jesus revealed it to him in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Now, in closing, I want to go over briefly establishing that there are things you learn at this table that you can't learn anywhere else. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the point I'm going to make here. I don't believe that this is clear to the average Christian that readiness for Christ's return postulates dying and living. Nobody who has not died with Christ and been raised with him will be ready when Jesus comes. Amen. Amen. Those who have not died with Christ and not been raised with him cannot possibly be ready at his return. As those that lived afterward. Those who lived before were living in anticipation of the, of the Christ. Those who do not frequent this table cannot get the needed oil. That's right. mm -hmm. It's not obtainable. What you get at this table cannot be obtained anywhere else. Amen. Till he come. It means he's meeting with us here mm -hmm. at this table. Now this is prefigured on the night Jesus was betrayed mm -hmm. when he instituted this table. He unveiled to his disciples things that he didn't unveil at other times. And I'm going to mention ten of the things. And it's, this is uh, not exhaustive at all. But all of these are necessary for your preparation for the Lord's return, and all of them were made known at the Lord's table. It's covered from John 13 through 16. First of all, he gave insight into his own personal humility at this table. This, as far as the record is concerned, is the only time Jesus did this. 
he did not make a practice of washing his disciples' feet. At least I don't, there's no evidence that he did. Yeah. But he did it at this table to show the disciples that to save them, he had to humble himself. Amen. He had to come down. He had to come down to save us. And uh, to prove that, he talked about his death, see. Because his death, he came down to be born. It, it required him to come down to be born. But see, he was born to die. So he washed his disciples' feet, told them to wash one another's feet now, help keep each other clean. John 13, 31 and 32, he talked about his glory, that he was going to be glorified. And that they, he, wanted the people, he wanted his disciples to see his glory. It was made known. His glory, the glory of Christ, is what you can see of Christ or comprehend hand of Christ. The glory of a thing is what you can see of it. Like the glory of the sun is the mm -hmm. is, yeah. is radiation. That's, that's the glory of the sun. The glory of the stars is what you can, what you can see of them. That's their glory. Mm -hmm. Now you see more of Christ in his death mm -hmm. than you see in his life. Yeah. That's his life on yeah. earth. Some say, well, that's pretty, pretty difficult. Well, that's the way it is. Because there's more in Christ's death than there was in his earthly ministry. He couldn't redeem anybody through his earthly ministry. That was in his death. See, there's more in his death. So he gave insight into his glory there. He even gave insight into loving one another. See, it was at the table. He told them at the table, he told us. He says, by this shall all men know you're my disciples. You have to love one for another. See, now I will tell you by experience, if you take this table seriously, you remember Jesus, you'll come away loving the brethren more. Amen. You will, because this is a demonstration of his love. And as you die to the world and so forth with him, it'll accent, accentuate your love for the brethren. That was made known at this table. And he gave some insight into, into why he was going away. He says, I'm going away to, to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. The truth of the matter is, Jesus wants us to be where he is. Amen. And he's in heaven. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. Where did he share that? <laughs> he shared that at this table. It's at this table where he shared it. So you can say, Jesus... Jesus wants me to be where he is. And he went there by through his death. His death was the vehicle through which he exited the world. That was made known to the table. And the, he, he revealed to them an association between himself and the Father. In John 14, 10 through 13. Talked about the Father's in me and I in the Father, and the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. He, he clarified the connection he had with the Father. Where did he do it? At the table. That's where he did it. There was insight into Christ's ministry. See, forgiving your sins was the beginning, not the end. He said, he who loves, this is what he said at the table. He said this at the table, John 14, 21 and 23. He said, he that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me, my, my father, my father will love him. Amen. And I'll love him. Mm -hmm. He made that known at the table. Yeah. So if you want to be convinced of the love of God and the love of Christ, you will learn a dimension of that love here that cannot be learned anywhere else. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's got to be seen in the death of Christ, and this that's what this table mm -hmm. is all about. And think of what he told his disciples about the Holy Spirit. He said, the comfort is going to come. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. The yeah. comfort is going to come. Amen. When he's come here, you're going to convince the world of sin and of judgment and righteousness and of judgment to come. The Comforter, he's going he's gonna to show everything to you. 
He's going to open it up to you. He's going to guide you into the truth. That's what the comfort is going to do. He's going to be with you forever. He'll, he'll not leave you. As long as you're here, he's, where did he tell him that? Amen. At the table. Amen. Yeah. That's where he told him. And where did he talk about the vine and the branches? Where was it exactly he talked about that? It was at this table. John 15 says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You're secondary, I'm primary. I'm a source, you're a product. See? He made that clear at this table. And he gave insight into prayer at this table. At this table, he said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Anything? That's what he said. You ask anything in my name. What does that mean, in my name? Well, it means you're, it's just... You're saying it's exactly the same thing he'd say. Mm-hmm. How can I do that? Well, you got to die with Jesus. Mm-hmm. you got to be raised with Jesus. Yeah. And when you die with Jesus and you're raised with Jesus, you think like Jesus and you ask like Jesus yeah. and you petition like Jesus. See, now these things are ministered at this table. Mm-hmm. They're important because you've got to be ready when Jesus comes and this is how you get ready. You don't get ready just by just by hard work. All of that is involved. <laughs> that is involved. But you get ready for Christ by being an expert in handling the things I just got through talking about, the insights I just got through talking about, by you being able to handle those. This is this is what empowers you to prepare for Christ's coming. So see, be preparing for Christ's coming is connected to this table. Yeah. Uh-huh. Till he comes. Amen. And the things that need to be done, there are things that need to be done all the way up to when he comes. And you're reminded of them here at this table because this is the, so far as the ordinances are concerned, this is the closest you get to the death of Christ. uh And the death of Christ, remember, that's the hub. Mm -hmm. If one died for all, then all are dead. That is, his death counts for everybody. Now, I'll leave that with you to ponder these things. This shows how wrong people that don't observe the Lord's table with any kind of regularity. See, they, they know not what they do. Yeah. Amen. They don't understand. Jesus said on the night of his betrayal, he said, with desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you. Not because of the Passover, because uh-huh. it was after the Passover, mm-hmm. not during the Passover, yeah, uh-huh. that he instituted the Lord's Supper. It's what it says, after supper. Yeah. You know what it says? After supper. after supper. So no, he did not institute it during the Passover. But the Passover was the closest framework you could get mm-hmm. at that time to the kind of deliverance, mm-hmm. the magnitude of the deliverance yeah. that Jesus was getting ready to work. Amen. So he waited till after they'd remembered it. He waited till after supper, and then he he told them about the things they wouldn't. They were so large they wouldn't understand them till after he'd been in heaven for a few Amen. days. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Then he could kind of open it up. So yes, the Lord's table is connected with the coming of the Lord. Brother Aaron has our exhortation.